It's a real honor and a pleasure to be uh, giving this talk to you guys at MGH. Um, I want to start off on the bad thing that I'm 0 for 2 at MGH. I just want to say that. Um, so I, uh, I interviewed for an MSK fellowship at MGH and didn't get that fellowship. And then I interviewed as, a, as an attending for the ED section with Dr. Lev two years later, and I didn't get that. So I'm hoping today I can go one for three and I get a win today. So, um, so we'll, we'll make that the goal today. But, but no, on a ser seriously, it's a, it, it's a real honor to be here. And thank you so much, Eric, and to all the people at MGH for inviting me. We're gonna talk today about tips on how to deliver a good lecture. You know, and quite frankly, it's not something that's, you know, easily understood by everyone. So I wanna, you know, you know make that the, the goal today. And what we're gonna do is, you know, our learning objectives are gonna be very brief, right? We're gonna describe intrinsic qualities to all great speakers. So, you know, all great speakers have certain things, you know, great speakers are all diverse, obviously. And, you know, there are a ton of different ways that you can be a great speaker, but all great speakers have some probably shared intrinsic qualities that make them great speakers. And then we're going to provide a blueprint on how to optimize content and deliver that content. So both of those things are very key. So the content has to be optimized and has to be effective. And then the delivery of that content has to also be uh, very effective in order for people to have um, great lectures. Okay. So what's the problem here? The problem is uh, we're all great at clinical work. You know, we're, we all, you know, are, are in radiology residency programs, we're mastering radiology, we're mastering imaging findings, diagnoses, um, and, you know, we're, we're great at that. But in terms of education, not all of us are great educators. And there's obviously a reason for that. And the reason for that is we haven't all received formal training in medical education. We, we spend years. Can, every, can everyone hear me, by the way? Yeah, can, I can hear you. Okay, okay, good. Um, so we spend years going through, you know, high school, college, medical school, you know, residency, fellowship, we get extensive training in, uh, in clinical radiology in terms of how to diagnose diseases and pathologies, how to offer treatment options and give our recommendations to expert consultants. Uh, many of us also have spent time learning how to do research, how to, you know, publish a paper, how to you know, devise a research study, test that with a hypothesis, and then carry out the research and get data through IRB approval. But how many of us have actually received formal training in how to teach? Um, probably very few of us, if not any of us, correct? So, you know, that's the, the, that's the problem. And teaching is an art, just like clinical radiology is. Teaching is an art, just like doing research is. Teaching is an art, just like playing basketball is right on, you know, on the basketball court, right? I mean, it takes practice and it takes training and, you know, you can't just, you know, what happens with, you know, medical students and people in the medical profession is we get thrown into education and we get thrown in to teach medical students, to teach other people, to teach our peers without having been given any formal instruction on how to do that. So that's where the problem rises, where people may struggle in delivering educational content effectively. So I want to open up these polls. So there are going to be a couple questions that we're going to ask throughout this lecture, and it's on poll everywhere. So if you guys can use your uh, cell phones, and if you text Omer Awan six three six to the number two two three three three, you'll be able to join this poll. So if you, so I just want you to text the number two two three 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 to the um, text um, the word Omer Awan O M E R A W A N six three six to that number, and then you can answer these questions. There will be a couple questions as we progress to the lecture. So we're going to start out with a very easy question: Have you given a lecture before? Yes or no? I'm assuming everyone is going to answer this question. Yes, I'd be surprised if I got any no answers, but you never know. So we'll see what people say here. So it looks like most people have answered, and and you know, not to my surprise, everyone has given a lecture before. So that's great. Um, good. So the formula for sex success in giving lectures, well, here it is right here. No, I'm just kidding. Obviously, there's no formula for success. Um, there are tons of great ways to give lectures. The, you know, the, the amount of excellence in lectures is just as diverse as the amount of people that give them, right? So, you know, there's no one, unfortunately, there's no one painted out formula that will allow you to be successful, but there are certain uh, principles that if you follow, you will give an excellent lecture to, to your residents or to your medical students or to your colleagues. And a lecture really should be thought of as a journey. It should be thought of as a journey, you know, going from point A 
to point B. And you're taking people with you on that journey, AKA your students. And really your students should be transformed after the lecture, after they get to point B. So that is very important. Um, and if your, if your students are not transformed or if they have not changed in some way, shape or form, the purpose of your lecture may not have fulfilled its function. And what I mean by that is if, if students haven't learned something by the end of your lecture, then you haven't really achieved your goal. If, uh, so really you should think of your lecture as taking your students on a journey with you so that they can acquire a skill or so that they can gain something that they didn't already have at the start of the lecture. So for example, in my lecture today, I would hope that by 1.15 today, you guys will have some insights on how to deliver better lectures. And if, if I have not done that, then I failed as an educator, obviously. So, you know, that, that's an important, you know, philosophical point to keep in mind when giving lectures and when giving, you know, delivering educational content. And to me, you know, and this is obviously just my opinion, but, you know, the key components to a successful presentation are three, are really three. And it's, it boils down to your qualities, your innate qualities as a speaker, okay? So the things that you bring to the table as a, as a speaker, your personal traits or characteristics, the content that you deliver, right? The quality of the content. Um, and we'll obviously talk about ways to maximize the quality of that content. And then the delivery of that content. So the delivery of that content is just as important as the quality, right? So you could have a phenomenal lecture planned out on PowerPoint, but if you don't deliver that successfully, it will be perceived as a mediocre, an average or a below average presentation. That's how important the delivery of that content is. And the same is true for the qualities of a speaker. You could have a phenomenal talk um, that you know, outlines you know, a, a, a topic in a very intricate manner, but if you don't have the passion or the engagement or the qualities that good speakers have to give it, it may not be that effective. So really all three of these uh, need, to, uh, need, to be, need to be kind of worked at together in order for someone to develop and, and give a successful presentation. So I have a picture here of Martin Luther King Jr., Barack Obama, and Hillary Clinton, all different people. But uh, I want to ask, and feel free to meet yourself and talk, what, what do you guys think that these three people have in common? What are some things that these three individuals may have in common? Anyone can answer. Gesticulating. Given big speeches. Okay, yeah, they're all, you know, public figures. They've all given big speeches. In terms of their ability to speak, what are some of the things that they have in common in terms of, in terms of their ability to speak or their ability to, 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 to command public speaking? They, they sound passionate and um, have an ability to connect with the audience. Absolutely. Those are two great points. So I heard, you know, they're very passionate and all three of them are very passionate. And they're able to connect to an audience, right? And those are all, again, intrinsic qualities that make them phenomenal speakers, right? That they're able to appeal to the broad masses in a very powerful and profound way. Anyone else want to offer any insights? Okay, all right, that's fine. Yeah, so, I mean, they all are obviously very prov provocative, uh, great, excellent speakers that are able to command an audience. I want to open up this question. What, what's the most important quality of an effective speaker for you? Is it, you know, I have five here. Is it ability to inspire? Is it eloquence? Is it relatability? Is it confidence or is it clarity? And I expect there to be, you know, some differences here, um, which is great. So it looks like the majority have clarity, someone being very clear in their speech. And um, some of the, a lot of people, some people have had ability to inspire, okay. And actually, if I were to answer this question, I would have also picked A, I would have picked ability to inspire. For me, that's the most important quality of an effective speaker. But, you know, there's obviously a wide range of, what's, of what, what people perceive, right? You know, sometimes people think eloquence is, some people think relatability is, some people may think that there are things that aren't even on this, uh, these five choices that are, right? But it sounds like clarity is a big thing. And I think that's obviously very important. You have to be very clear in the way you enunciate your speech. You have to speak in a way that, is relatable and that people can understand what you're saying, obviously, in order to be an effective speaker. So very good. If you were to do a Google cloud or a word cloud of great speaker, this is what you would find. This is the slide that you would find. And notice that there are a lot of keywords here for a great speaker. 
you know, communication, obviously. They have to be effective communicators. Connection, that was something that someone had said, you know, ability to connect to your audience, right? That's very important for a speaker to do or else the speech is not gonna be effective. People, social, discussion, receiver, conversation, skill, two-way. Notice that it's, all this is related to communication and, you know, listening, hearing, two-way communication, connection, uh, nonverbal, so nonverbal cues being very important, not just what you say, but the way you say it, right? All these things are, you know, it's, it's very difficult just to pinpoint one thing that makes a great speaker, but it's really all of these things that are seen in a gestalt that allows someone to be an effective speaker. So in my opinion, uh, these are the four things that I'm gonna focus on today. The intrinsic qualities of a great speaker are, you know, someone that is very engaging. I think that may be one of the most important things for someone to be a great speaker and to give a good talk. Relatable, confident, and passionate. And I'll talk about each of these individually because I think they're that important when giving a talk. And engagement is super key, super key uh, to engage your audience, right? Because what do we mean by engagement? We mean, can you attract your audience? Can you keep their attention? And that's really important, especially in this day and age, especially with the millennial generation that has a ton of information at their disposal. If they can't, if, if, if your audience feels that you cannot give them what they want, they will automatically zone you out and will start going on their phones, going on their computers and start looking stuff up on their own. And that's, you know, that, that, that's okay. But you have to be able to, as a speaker, to attract your learners in a meaningful way so that you can keep their attention. And that's what we mean by engagement. Engagement is, is attracting your audience to yourself or attracting your audience to the content that you're delivering. Um, you must always think about who your learners are. Okay, so giving a talk, for example, giving a talk to residents or to you guys is much different than giving a talk to seventh graders. And in fact, I do do that. I, I, I teach Sunday school on Sundays um, and I give a talk and my students are seventh graders. That's it's the way I prepare for my uh, Sunday school sessions is much different than the way I prepare for giving resident lectures or fellow lectures, aka you guys. Right. So always consider your audience and always consider how you can relate to them, how you can attract them. Um, and every audience is gonna be different. When I give a talk at RSNA, it's gonna be completely different, right? Because the majority of my audience is not gonna be residents, it's gonna be uh, people in private practice who are trying to learn things about musculoskeletal radiology, right? So I have, to, I have to design the talk in a way that I can captivate their audience, or I can captivate their attention. There's always an unconscious and an unconscious bias of learners. And I wanna, I wanna relate to you something that I read in a study that I think is very telling. One of the authors, and I, for, I honestly forgot who the author was, but they had said that students uh, have a bias of the presenter or they form perceptions of the presenter within 10 seconds of them starting the lecture. I mean, that's, you have a very short window. That's amazing, right? I, I was blown away by that statistic. Like within 10 seconds, you know, people have already made up their minds as to whether they think somebody is gonna be a good lecture or a poor lecture. So right off the bat, they will know whether they wanna actually pay attention during the lecture or they wanna kind of snooze and zone out during the lecture. So um, I'm hopeful that I have, I have a positive perception going forward or else no one's gonna be listening to what I'm saying right now, but if not, that's okay. But, you know, right away. So, you know, you have to really, the presenter has to make an impression very fast during the lecture or else you're at risk of not being able to captivate and attract your audience from the get-go. And often you can tell, you know, what, how, how engaging you've done just by looking at your audience. You know, you, we obviously know that, you know, the person who's presenting this lecture on the left has captivated his audience very well, right? Everyone is smiling, they're clapping, they look like they're engaged um, into what the person is saying. Whereas on the right side, you know, everyone is half asleep, right? So, you know, you can tell, you know, it's not rocket science to identify whether or not you're doing a good job in relating to your audience, right? So you can, you can read people's faces as to how you're doing as a, as a presenter. And there are many ways, many, many ways to engage your audience. We could have the whole hour talking about how to engage your audience, right? And, but that's obviously not the purpose of this talk. But the bottom line is, is that you wanna, as somebody, as, as one of the residents have pointed out, you wanna connect with your learners. If you cannot connect with your learners, 
the talk is not going to be effective. It's as simple as that. It's literally as simple as that. So there are many ways you can connect. Eye contact. Eye contact is a great way. Obviously, I'm doing Zoom and I can't look anyone. I can't look Eric or Dr. McLeod in the eye, but I can, you know, try and use my hands and body language to, you know, sort of present my case. But when you're presenting, your eyes shouldn't really be on your slides. It should be on the audience. You should have a command of your of your knowledge so that you don't have to constantly look at your slides when you're talking and you can actually look at the people that you're presenting to because that forms a rapport and a relationship right off the bat with your audience. So that's very important. Your body language, how enthusiastic you are, you know, how how lively you are. These are all things that help engage your audience. Even smiling, you know, just showing a smile and showing compassion during the talk can go a long way. Um, and these are, these are common sense things that everyone knows, but a lot of people fail to do. A lot of people fail to do when they're giving talks, and which is why, hence why I'm mentioning them here. You know, simple hand movements, you know, simple, succinct hand movements that emphasize certain points during your lecture can also help attract your audience. There have been some studies that show walking around during a lecture and can help engage audience and can help keep people's attention. I actually try to do that when I'm giving a talk. If you see me at AUR or RSNA, you may see me start walking around the room when I'm giving a lecture. And that's something that I do because I think that it keeps people on their toes. It keeps, it adds an element of suspense to the lecture that they don't know why I'm doing that or, or whether I'm gonna walk towards them. They may feel that they have to, uh, to, to pay more attention. Okay, so all those, all these are just very small things that can go a long way in a trajectory to engaging an audience. And the bottom line again is you have to connect with your learners in some way, shape, or form, okay? If you do that, you will be able to engage your audience. Being relatable is another key characteristic in delivering an effective lecture. And this is something that unfortunately not everyone does. And I, I, I've, I've seen a lot of lectures and I actually, you know, I observe some of my faculty members giving lectures often. And this is one thing that I think a lot of people can improve upon. And, and it's very easy to improve. You literally just have to put yourself in someone else's shoes. You should, everyone when they're giving a lecture should think before they're giving the lecture, well, who am I giving this lecture to? Am I giving it to medical students? Am I giving it to residents? And then put yourself in their shoes. If I was a resident right now at MGH at this time, what would I want to learn about acute, acute pancreatitis? What are the things that I need to know to be an effective clinician in the ED and you know at the workstation and to be an expert consultant on acute pancreatitis. What are the things that I should stress for them to be successful? That's the, those are the type of questions that you have to ask yourself before you give the lecture. Because if you make the content relevant to the people that are listening, it's gonna be well received. It's automatically gonna be well received. You have to tailor your talk to their needs. And that's the key. The key is to tailor all of the, the entire talk to what they need to know. Because if you're gonna tell them things that they don't need to know, a, they're not gonna listen and B, they're not gonna care about it 10 minutes after you're done giving the lecture. So you're not gonna be able to inspire your audience if you don't give them what they really need to know. I think the last question that I have here is very important. So how can I make this topic as simple as possible for my audience to understand? Lectures should be as simple as possible. It's amazing how many lectures I hear where people are talking about all these intricate, complex topics that no one is going to retain after the lecture. I mean, it's, 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 it's that simple. I mean, the key, the, the mark of a good educator is making complex topics simple, not the other way around, not the other way around. If you're making, if you, if you, if you make the topic more complex than it is and people can't understand it, you have not fulfilled your function as an educator, you know, great and fantastic educators are able to take topics that are very hard to dissect, and make it in a way that's very easy for people to understand. And that's an art, that's an art. That's not something that everyone can do, but with practice, everyone can achieve that. And that's really, that's the goal. That's the goal of, of, of delivering an excellent talk. How to be relatable? Well, you just have to think. You just, it, 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 it's just all effort. It's thinking about, thinking deeply about what your learners need from you. You know, uh, putting context in your in your content. You know, you know, if you're giving a talk, 
you know, about if I'm giving a talk on, you know, carpal malalignment and I talk about, you know, a lunate dislocation, a perilunate dislocation, and I, you know, tell my learners, so, you know, the next time that you're on call in the ED and you see a pie-shaped lunate, always look at the lateral view to discern what type of carpal dislocation has occurred. You know, I'm giving context to my talk right there. I'm, I'm, I'm putting myself in their shoes. I'm saying that next time you're on call or, you know, I'm, I'm letting them know that I understand some of the things that they go through when they're on call. So just by putting something in context, you're, you're, all, you're automatically relating to your audience. The, the audience is like, oh, wow, this person is talking about being on call. That's, that's an experience that I have to go through. Um, so that right away allows them to, to, to relate to your content. And I think that's something that's very simple, but very powerful, unbelievably powerful when, you, when you're giving a talk or a lecture. Being confident, and we all, you know, that, that's an important skill. Um, what do you guys fear the most? This is a question. I think this is like a free response question, I believe. What do you fear the most? Dr. Awan, we see the uh, blank screen and it's not updating. Oh, okay. Maybe, maybe it requires sharing the entire screen. Rather than sure. Um, I think it's, um, it may be my internet connection with Poll Everywhere because, um, yeah, that's fine. Maybe it's just not working right now. Okay, looking dumb. Okay, good. That's good. Now it's working. Good. So failing, looking dumb. You know, the fear of failure is obviously a very important thing. Um, I, I used to have fear of failures all the time. You know, I would literally, I remember when I was in high school, actually, like I would, I would, I would fear failing like chemistry exams. Like I would, I would have a dream like the night before my chemistry exam and like I'd, I'd, I'd have dreams that I was like failing the test and stuff. So and that can be a very powerful motivator for sure. Um, fear itself, that reminds me of FDR, you know, we have nothing to fear but fear itself. That's interesting. Altered mental status, okay, that's interesting. Um, so, you know, fear is, fear is a, a, an important thing, right? You know, most, I mean, there was a study that showed, you know, the people, that, the thing that people fear the most are snakes. Snakes is number one. And actually number two is public speaking. So public speaking was actually the second most feared thing in a survey that was given, you know, a, a very broad survey. So public speaking can be very tough, obviously, right? It's, it's a very, it, it's, it's a hard thing for some people to do. Some people are obviously natural at it, but some people, you know, it's, it's a skill that has to be acquired. But, you know, it's just like anything in life, right? Practice makes perfect. If you want to be an awesome free throw shooter in basketball, I mean, I'm going to use a lot of sports analogies because I really love basketball and tennis. So I apologize for that in advance. But, you know, if you, if you love, if you want to be a good free throw shooter, you have to shoot free throws. You have to shoot free throws, okay? Um, the more you practice your craft, the better you get at it. Public speaking is no different. It's absolutely no different. If you want to get better at speaking, speak more record yourself that's a, now it's so easy we have zoom where we can record ourselves right um we literally can record ourselves when we're when we're speaking so um that's something that's very powerful and you can you can record yourself and then you can you can see if you know your lecture is well received are you going too fast are you going too slow i have a habit of speaking super fast that's what all my residents tell me they say i speak like 100 miles an hour so sometimes when i record myself i'm like oh wow yeah i'm speaking super fast i may be speaking super fast right now um so recording yourself can be very instrumental and very key in, uh, in maybe slowing your pace down and you know, identifying things that you didn't say well that you wanted to say better. Um, and it can you know, flesh out awkward areas where you could have performed better where you didn't. Having someone critique you is also very important. I think that's something that, you, uh, that is not used enough. So every department has master educators, you know, whether they're, you know, explicit or not, but every department has, you know, people that are very well versed in education or most departments do, I should say. And, you know, really, you know, having someone critique your lecture can be very instrumental. When I, when I started out, you know, um, as a, as a, as a clinician educator, I would have people critique me. I would have other older senior attendings to critique my lectures. I would say, Hey, can you stop by for 45 minutes? I'm giving a talk. I would love to hear your feedback on how I did. You know, it's as simple as that. Um, and you know, that it can be very instructive because they can give you advice that you otherwise would not have thought about. You otherwise would not have thought about. Okay. Um, you know, for example, one time when I was at Dartmouth, my first job was at Dartmouth. I was an ED attending at Dartmouth. I had Petra Lewis, who's, you know, a, a very well-renowned educator. 
you know, critique one of my lectures, you know, my first year as an attending in 2014. And she had said something to me that, you know, I didn't even consider, you know, she said, you know, maybe, you know, in, because I was using RSNA Diagnosis Live at the time, she was like, maybe you should, you know, change the order of the way you're asking questions. So instead of, you know, asking the question after the case, maybe asking the question before the case and then having sometimes mixing it up and, and asking the question in the middle of your, your discussion of the case. And I thought that was a very uh, helpful and insightful uh, tool that I, I would never have probably thought about on my own. So, you know, sometimes it can be very instructive for you. And that hat, recording yourself and critiquing your lectures will build confidence. The more you critique yourself, the more you record yourself, the more confident you're going to be the next time you go and deliver a lecture. And obviously, the more you do, the better you get at it. It's, it's like any other art. Um, being passionate is also very important, right? And that's actually one of my favorite qualities, like how, showing how much you care about the topic, your students, your time. Because think about it. If, if you don't care, if you're giving a talk about MRI imaging findings of acute osteomyelitis and you don't care about it, how do you expect your students to care about it? How do you expect your medical students, you know, the people that are sitting in the room to care about your topic if you yourself don't care about the topic, right? So you have to show, you You have to exude that passion, that love for the topic, because that's what all great teachers love the things that they're teaching, right? So that's what you want to do, that you want, you want to show how much you care and how much you love your topic. Bring, you know, bring your A game, you know, be excited about what you're doing. You know, that's, that's the key. When you see that, your students are going to see that and it's going to be contagious and they're going to get excited. They may not even care about the topic, but by the end, they will want to read more about the topic because you've shown that passion. It, it ha it's through your body language, the way you talk, the way you're moving, the, your tone of your voice. Um, all these things matter. All these things count, you know, when you're giving a talk. So, um, Keep, pay attention to that and pay attention to the way you're speaking and your interest and your overall enthusiasm. And that's something that anyone can do. You know, it's not, it's not, it's not a trait that you have to learn. It's just something that you bring, right? And you, do you care about it? Are you interested in it? Do you want to do it? Right? So that's why it's also one of my favorite qualities, because I think that it's something that everyone can do. You know, you don't have to have an innate, uh, you know, you don't have to be born with passion. You can just develop the passion and do it and show people. I want to move on now to the actual the content of the lectures. We talked about the intrinsic qualities of speakers, but I want to talk a little bit about the content and the delivery of that content, and both of which, again, are extremely important when we're giving talks. Okay, and in terms of content, we're going to talk about two things. One is the content has to be audience centered, and I alluded to this a little bit initially, but I want to, you know, expand upon what I mean by this. It needs to be audience centered. You have to address the needs of your audience when giving a talk, okay? When you're talking about MRI imaging or ultrasound imaging of liver transplant complications, it doesn't, you don't need to regurgitate the 20 different complications that can occur with liver transplants, but give residents what they need or what they need to know so they, they can be functioning competent radiologists. Maybe provide with them with the seven or eight most common, 90% most common uh, complications that they will need and go into those in depth. That's, that's more powerful than just listing 25 complications that no one's going to remember at the end of your lecture, right? So you want to really think hard. You know, actually, when I give a talk, I spend more time planning than actually creating my slides. And that may sound weird, but it's actually very true. I spend triple the amount of time thinking about how I'm going to give the talk or what I want to include into the talk versus how, how, much, um, how much time actual putting my slides together. So for example, I just put together an RSNA talk on, on, on an education thing that I'm giving at RSNA this, this, this November. It took me probably four hours to come up with the content that I want to do and how I want to do it, how I want to organize my slides. And it probably took me 30 minutes to put the slides together. And I'm being 100% honest. That's the way maybe you want to think about delivering your talk, right? Think about the companies or the key competencies or the key points that your learners need to learn. Think hard and think deeply about those. What is it that you really want them to know from the talk that you're about to deliver? And write those learning objectives based on those needs. That's why we make learning objectives, learning objectives in Bloom's taxonomy, because we want to keep the the lecture as focused as possible. So you take, you see this, you want to keep it, your lecture on a straight line. You don't want to be 
you know, swerving, going off topic. Okay. Keep it very focused and keep it in a way that you're doing it so that you're tailoring it to the people who you're delivering it to need to know. And the purpose really is to teach your learners, not show how much you know. That's the purpose is not to show or show off how much you know about a certain topic. It's to give them content that they can then use so that they can benefit from it, right? You're doing like, you're doing a service to your audience, right? Um, it has nothing to do with you. It has everything to do with your audience. So I think that's an important point to understand when delivering content. You have to appeal to a diverse array of learners. Remember, there are some learners that learn better through hearing. They're auditory learners. There are some learners, and actually many radiology residents tend to be visual learners because radiology is inherently a visual field. They learn by seeing, by looking at the pictures, by showing them an image. There's some that learn that are kinesthetic. They're learned by doing, by actually physically doing. You know, they're doing a procedure. You know, they don't just learn by seeing someone do a paracentesis. They have to physically do the paracentesis to learn how to do it, right? So, and many are a combination of all three, but make sure that when you're giving or crafting a lecture that you appeal to the diverse array of learners. Have some auditory content, you know, speak in a way or increase your tone of voice or em emphasize certain points so that you appeal to auditory learners. Perhaps give a YouTube video before your lecture so that people who are auditory learners can, can understand the content better. Be visual, show a lot of images, right? Show a ton of images, which is what I think everyone does anyways in radiology to appeal to visual learners. Be kinesthetic, maybe have some activities, maybe do a flip classroom technique where you have them read something or do something before the lecture, right? So all these things, if you can appeal to all the diverse array of learners, you will be successful because no matter what type of learner the person is, they will benefit from your lecture, right? So always keep that in mind when you're, when you're crafting your lecture and you're forming your lecture. You have to also appeal to all the different levels of residency, right? So there are first year residents in your lecture. Sometimes there's fourth year residents. There's first year medical students sometimes and there's fourth year medical students. When you go to RSNA, you may have people that are right out of practice. You may have very seasoned people that have been practicing radiology for 30 years. You have to appeal to all of them and all of their levels. So keep that in mind when you're doing a lecture. You know, when you show a case, maybe have some novice teaching points and advanced teaching points for people that, you know, know more about the topic. When you're showing case conferences, maybe have, maybe stratify your cases. So have a case taken by a first or second year and then have a case taken by a third or fourth year because it's more advanced, right? And you can actually label the cases like, okay, this, is, this case is for a first year resident. This case is for a fourth year resident, right? And make sure your teaching points appeal to everyone, right? So you don't, when you're teaching an advanced case, at least have a teaching point that's basic so that first and second years can also benefit from that lecture. That's also a very important point that I think a lot of educators don't quite understand. The content has to also be engaging, right? So the content itself has to be engaging. So there are a lot of active learning techniques that increase engagement and learning retention. There are tons of articles in the literature that I'm sure you guys all know about, you know, that show that, you know, audience response and flip classroom techniques, these things help engage learning, you know, increase learning retention are just, and are very well received by learners. This is a question that I'd like to ask everyone. What's your favorite audience response tool? Is it, you know, these are just four here. Is it Poll Everywhere, Kahoot, Nearpod, or RSNA Diagnosis Live? Let's see what people think here. So we have a 50-50 spread right now. I know that RSNA Diagnosis Live is no longer present, but I included it anyways for a reason I'll explain in a second. Okay, so we have sort of a, you know, a, a a divided spread, but it looks like Poll Everywhere is a winner. My favorite was RSNA Diagnosis Live by far. I'm very sad that we don't have it anymore, that the RSNA has decided to, to stop using this. I thought it was very relevant to radiology, but um, I Poll Everywhere would probably be my second, but you know, all have advantages and disadvantages. But the key is to try to incorporate some of these when you're giving lectures because it keeps learners engaged. It keeps them attentive um, and it keeps the content attentive, right? So um, audience response tools are very good. Um, at you know getting people to answer questions, think about questions in a very anonymous way, where you know there's no punishment and it's not it's non-punitive. You know people can answer questions without the fear of being judged. Whereas you know at, on a hot seat, sometimes you know uh, students can feel judged when they're looking at cases. Flip classroom techniques has been very well received by learners. You know a lot of residents, medical students, you know appreciate this and you know, like to be actively involved by looking at things and learning things so that they can learn more high order concepts in the classroom. Um, it's been very well received. 
Gamification is also very important. Um, the competitive atmosphere or environment that games provide, whether it's Jeopardy, Pictionary, even Diagnosis Live, Kahoot. Kahoot has a gaming mechanism. Um, those games, that competitive fire can help people compete and engage and you know be attentive during the lecture so that you know they're motivated to get questions right so that they can win the competition essentially, right? Um, even drawing, you know, you know, using, you know, doing like Pictionary or drawing certain diagnoses during lectures can be very instructive for learners and having people or your students draw certain things during lectures um, can, can help um, keep the content be engaging. So all those are, you know, just some, some things that you can potentially use when giving lectures. You know, this is just a chart, you know, kind of outlining, you know, the differences between Diagnosis Live and Poll Library. Again, I know that Diagnosis Live doesn't exist, but I really liked it. And, you know, I'm, I'm just praying that it comes back at some point because uh, it was just such an awesome tool, especially for, um, for radiology, because it was very radiology centric. It was made with radiology education in mind, whereas these other tools weren't necessarily made for that. But, you know, Poll Everywhere, with that said, has, you know, hot image hot seat questions where you can click on an image, which is very, you know, you know, central for radiology. It also has a lot of key features that Diagnosis Live didn't have, like you can use Google Slides and Keynote with it. So, you know, there are a lot of nice things about Poll Everywhere um, that weren't seen with Diagnosis Live. But, you know, the, the, the important thing really isn't to compare and contrast the different, you know, audience response tools, but to, you know, consider using them because they can augment your, your lecture in some way, shape or form. The delivery of the content is also very key, right? So, for example, an average lecture in radiology ranges from 30 to 90 minutes. We're going to be talking today for hopefully 45 or 50 minutes today, but um, that's a short time or a long time, right? And it's a short time to really get your audience engaged, or it can be a very long and brutal time where everyone is falling asleep during your lecture. But what I find in lectures, you know, when I see lectures and when I see even my, you know, people giving me lectures is why on earth do people think that they have to cover every single detail about a specific topic? If you're talking about, you know, the radiographic appearance of arthritis or something, why do you need to spend your entire time talking about every single arthritis known to man with, you know, the radiographic features, the CT features, the MR features, and the ultrasound features for all of those different diagnoses? That's, that's a waste of everyone's time, including yourself, right? <coughs> including yours, putting the slides together. Um, really focus on the details that matter. Focus on the high yield concepts that residents or your students are more likely to take away from. Um, and focus on those and tailor your lectures to those so that they can get something out of it. It's more important for a student to come out learning two or three new things that they can implement versus hearing a whole overview about a topic that they can't implement anything afterwards, right? So, you know, always think, always be mindful of that. Always be mindful about what you're talking about and how you can impact your audience. This is an, believe it or not, this is literally an average PowerPoint slide that we see in, you know, in lectures. And no, no one's going to read that. You know, you put that on the slide, no one's going to read that entire thing. I mean, you may read it, but, you know, you're going to get, you're going to get, you know, you're going to feel tired after reading the three or four lines, right? And that's, you'll be surprised that the vast majority of people when they're giving lectures have slides that are very dense that no one reads, right? So what's the point of doing that? If you have a slide that that's dense, there's no one that's, it's not effective, right? So it's better to keep things very simple and concise. Try instead to have fewer words and more pictures on slides, okay? There's something called cognitive load or cognitive overload where you start to see a lot of information, you just zone out and you don't wanna learn anything more. And that happens very frequently when you see very dense power slides, PowerPoint slides. Remember that you are the show and not your slides, right? When you're giving a talk, the focus should be on you or the presenter, not your slides, right? So you're, you're the one that's making the impact. Your slides are not making the impact. Your slides are a vehicle for you to make that impact. Right, so you are the show, not your slides. And you know, I like to just include one or two teaching points per slide. That's it. You don't need to have eight or nine bullet points on, on a slide. You really don't need to do that. And it's probably better for your students if they see less. The less, sometimes less is better, and more is not always better. So you know, when you're when you're delivering content, sometimes telling a story can be very impactful. So for example, you know, you know, when, there was a time when you know my mother, I was a radiology resident. My mother came to the ED. She had hemoptysis. She was coughing up blood. We were all panicking, right? We brought her into the ED. She had a CT of the chest and her CT showed, you know, areas of ground glass attenuation within the lung apices, right? So kind of like in a crazy paving pattern where you have 
ground glass attenuation in the interlobular septal thickening in the lungs, right? So, you know, if I ever were to teach about crazy paving, I would, I would talk about my mother in the ED. You know, just telling that story brings emotion into the content, right? And we're naturally all drawn to stories and emotion. And this is something that increases engagement, it increases people's interest in the topic. I guarantee you if, you, if you teach crazy paving by providing a story, more residents, more students will remember what crazy paving is. Whereas if I don't tell a story, the, the retention rate will be far less, will be far less, right? So telling a story can be very instructive and can be very meaningful when, when delivering you know, content in a lecture. So that's all I had. I hope what we did was describe the intrinsic qualities of all great speakers. We talked about, you know, four qualities that speakers have um, that I think are very beneficial when, when giving lectures. And then hopefully I gave you somewhat of a blueprint, albeit a very, you know, a small blueprint on how to optimize that content and deliver that content so that you can be effective. Um, I want to end with this quote from William Arthur Ward. It's one of my favorite quotes that uh, about teaching. It's the mediocre teacher tells, the good teacher explains, the superior teacher demonstrates, and the great teacher inspires. And hopefully what we're trying to do is we're trying to inspire the next generation of trainees and educators to be the best that they possibly can, and to be the best consultants that they possibly can. Thank you so much for your time. I do want to let you know that I have a YouTube channel. It's called Omar Awan Rad Education. Um, if you don't know about that, please subscribe. I would appreciate it. I have a ton of educational content on there. Um, and it would be great to, to, um, to have you guys take a look at that. And I'm happy to answer any questions that you guys have.